Hi, everyone. Um, I don't know if everyone can hear me, but I think we're going to give it just a minute or two for people to come in. <coughs> okay. Okay. So, um, Hi, everyone. Welcome to Periodismo del Barrio. Uh, my name is Danny Rivero. I'm a reporter in, at the NPR station here in Miami, WLRN. I've been a reporter for, for over, just over 10 years now. Um, learned a lot about things over that period of time. Um, it's an interesting job because the more you get into it, the more you understand like how the system actually works who controls the levers of power, who to ask questions to, um, who's really driving the change, like which parts of what decide which things. If that sounds complicated, um, we'll, we'll get into it and that's part of it. But I think it's something that, uh, you know, journalism and advocacy go very hand in hand. Um, it's all information based. It's all trying to figure out who's doing what for what reason um and then questioning it and whatnot so it's, it's very similar things so let me let me get started here all right i'm gonna share my screen okay all right let me check the chat is everyone okay great i don't know if you can see the chat window okay i'm gonna stop it okay so um Periodismo del Barrio, right? It's what I named it because I think this is stuff that can be applied actually anywhere. It can be applied in your neighborhood, in your state, wherever you are, or at the federal level, right? Um, but it all starts locally. And like the place that you can make the most impact on things is locally. And also Periodismo del Barrio is a, the name of a very, it's a very good independent media outlet in, in Cuba. So. And I know some of those people, so I borrowed their name, um, which I'm, I'm sure they're fine with. All right, so let's, hold on. Okay, so, but first, Civics 101, right? Uh, so, and please bear with me, but like, this is just like really important stuff to think about if you wanna do journalism, if you wanna do advocacy, like just understanding how the system works right because we don't have actually just one system we have actually like three four maybe different systems that all interact to create the different levels of government that we have right um so on the left hand side it's like the national government right they regulate a lot of things they um they have the military we have you know they can declare war the post offices the federal courts they are the ones that control um social security medicaid for for poor disabled people um medicare for the elderly right that's the national government state governments they can also tax things state governments tend to put a lot more money and funding into public education like that's k through 12 but also college education so if you're going to be doing advocacy on that front it's probably at the state level where you're going to have a lot of um success in that 
Um, you know, they can they regulate things like marriage. You know, it's the, the states do the states things. And then in the in the middle, it's the things that are kind of shared powers. We're not going to get too much into the shared powers. Um, but I just want you to think about this stuff, right? And here's an even more complicated graph. Um, so knowing like where the issue that you're trying to tackle falls in this graph is it should determine like where your energy and where your focus goes, right? Um, and let me let me take you through a couple examples of this. So like the best way to understand how governments run is through the budgets, right? Like some people say like the budgets are moral documents. Like these are things that um you know, say what we care about and they say, you know, what we're putting our energy towards, right? And that goes to what we spend money on, but it's also like where we get the money from. So I'm going to start at the local level here. This is the city of Miami where I live. This is where the government gets the money from. It's, as you can see, it's more than half of it is property taxes, right? And this is pretty typical actually of a lot of, of, of cities. That's why, you know, gentrification becomes an issue, um, overdevelopment becomes an issue. Well, basically, government is trying to figure out how to make more money, and they make more money by property taxes. So as a place gentrifies, it's better for the government. Doesn't mean it's better for the people, but it's better for the government. So you have to understand, like, why they're making the decisions that you're making when you're questioning it, right? Um, there's a bunch of other things, but, like, by far, property taxes at the local level is where they make their money. Um, uh, okay, here's a, the state version, right? This is Florida. 77.1% of their revenue is sales tax. So that's like actual taxes on things. So if at the local level, they're trying to get, you know, real estate to be worth more at the state level, they actually want people to buy things. Like, that's what, that's what it's based on. At least in a state like Florida, we don't have a state income tax. Um, a handful of states don't have state income tax. Some do, but it's typically like very small. Um, but either way, like a lot of the revenue actually comes from sales tax. So the creation of malls and like commercial centers, that's where a lot of it comes from. Like, you know, you see corporate, in corporate income tax, it's 7.7%. It's not a whole lot. It's something, but just think about these things as you're thinking about what you're doing in your advocacy. Uh, this is the federal budget, right? This is where the federal money gets money from. Um, as you can see, individual income taxes are a lot. Um, and payroll taxes, those two things together, that's uh, that's basically like your income tax and also like the Social Security and Medicare taxes that they take out from every paycheck. That's most of the money. They get some other stuff and the other, it's like, fees for people like coming to the US for vacation, you have to like, you know, visa processing, other things, corporate income tax, which is where a lot of debate is, as you can see, it's actually a really small part of this. And part of it's like Amazon pays zero, basically, or at least they have for a while. But now, you know, it helps understand where the money comes from when you're trying to, to advocate for certain things. Um, and I want to move from where the money comes from to where the money's spent. So how the money gets spent. This is the federal, the federal part, right? First of all, you can see like we're getting in 3.4 trillion and this is for 2020, 2021. We're spending a lot more money than we're getting. So like, just keep that in mind. You know, there's all these debates in Congress right now. Like, yeah, they're kind of right. We, we're, we're spending way more than we're taking in, which is a problem. Um, but this part like these, like Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, they call them, some people call them like entitlements, but there's basically things that there's not votes happening on that. It's like all things that we agree we need to fund, right? Um, this area right here, the, the, the non-defense um, discretionary funding is like actually where most of the debate happens, but you see how small that is. Now, this is, was a weird year because it was a pandemic and there was like PPP loans and other things, right? But it, it's pretty small, actually. Like out of this, this chunk of money that we actually like make decisions about, it's usually almost half is towards the military. So again, think about that, you know? So that, in, this thing, the, this non-defense spending is like colleges, it's, uh, um, 
research. It's like, it's a whole lot of things. And, and this is, it's actually a pretty small chunk of, of what we do. Um, all right. So then here's to the state. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Actually, a lot of state money goes towards healthcare, which healthcare tends to, for a reason I don't quite understand, like skip the states. Like people advocate for the federal government. Like it's actually the states that do most of the work and, and kick in most of the funding, um, or at least a bigger percentage of the funding. And then also education, like higher education, K through 12, it's all funded through the states basically. It's a little bit. And also notice here, like natural resources and environment. Um, this, is, this is for Florida, for instance, but it's a lot. Like there's a lot of money that goes into that. Um, so if you're going to advocate for environmental issues, the states are actually a really good place to start. And you can see that just through how much spending they have. All right. And then this is a local level, right? Again, city of Miami, more than half of the spending is for public safety. So that's police and fire. And this is very typical of cities, right? So if you're advocating on something about police, you know, practices or whatever, like the local level is where you want to go. Um, I don't understand why, or I guess I understand why, because of like political dysfunction. Everyone, every issue has become federalized where people like ask the White House or Congress to like fix something. You know, every time there's a new video that comes out about police brutality, it's like the White House do something. It's like, that's literally not where this happens. Like this happens at the local level. So if you're advocating on something, it's important to know that. Um, so, all right, enough Civics 101, like how do we actually report? Like how do we do like fact gathering, right? Um, public meetings, I'll start with, are your best friend. And uh, let's watch this video for a second because this is the kind of thing you see sometimes at public meetings. Uh, My name is Chad Kroger. Um, Council, when I'm bummed, I party, and uh, I feel better for a while. The party's really sick, though. I feel better for longer. A lot of ragers have made me feel really stoked. Keggers at my buddy Danny's, phone parties, and bottle service at Hakkasan. The ragers that truly make my froth peak, though, and this is beyond debate, are on a boat. Nothing feels as legit as being on a yacht deck with a linen shirt open. My body tight from a pre vacay juice cleanse. What a freaking boost. One thing that bums me out, though, is that not everyone gets to participate. Why is it that only people like P. Diddy, Jeff Bezos, and my Uncle Ron get to experience the euphoria of being on a yacht? I think I have the solution. We need public yachts. 60 to 100. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think you get the idea of, of what, I'm, uh, what I'm referring to, right? Like, it's just public meetings run like that. You never really know what you're gonna get. Um, sometimes there's really good comments and like thoughtful comments. And then sometimes it's like kind of wild things like that. So how to follow government meetings, right? I mean, these, happens at, these happen at all levels of government, the federal government, states, local governments, but this is basically where things get done. You know, if you're trying to like gather information, if you're trying to understand what's going on, like you need to either go or tune in after the fact to, to these public meetings, especially what we just saw, like public comment. That's where people in the community, like they go up and they speak directly to the elected, um, you know, members. And they say like, hey, here's the problem. Here's what's going on. I agree with your solution. I don't agree with it. You should change this, whatever. Like that's where it happens. And then you learn the names of people in your community that are working on similar issues. You can connect dots with people, you get their phone numbers, stay in touch with them, um, and really start to get a, like a wholesale understanding of what's going on, right? Like public comment, government meetings is where that all happens. Um, okay, like how to follow government meetings. Um, hold on, I'm checking the chat. Okay, yachts for all, exactly. I wish I had a yacht. Um, so, the it's kind of complicated but like there's different levels like you know the full meetings where like everyone meets and like they finally do a vote for something that they've been talking about for a long time those meetings tend to be like just pure politics you know especially if it's like in a state government or the federal government where it's like the red team versus the blue team like it's just politics like that's not actually the best 
use of your time to like follow that level. A lot of things, really important things happen at the what they call like the committee level or um, like board meetings. This is something like I, I say here, like code enforcement. Like if you wanna see how your city actually operates, like go watch a code enforcement board meeting. And then you'll see like people having issues with the city. They say like, this happened to this person on that street at that exact address. And here's what the city's doing to them. And then like, and you actually see like how the levers of power in the local government work, right? It happens at that level of meeting. It's like a board meeting. Um, and at, you know, at the, at the state level, like, you know, there's committees that are just like a handful of, um, uh, elected officials, like they hear issues, they hear testimony. Um, it's kind of like a problem solving and debate place. I mean, the debate is not so much for the people who are elected to office, it's for like the people that show up. Like a lot of times you just get a variety of perspectives and that's really useful if you're trying to understand like where you fit in, what, what information you want, right? At the federal level, yeah, like the committees are the places for debate. They call up witnesses and hear testimony and whatnot. But like I said, once everyone's in the same room, like it's just pure politics. Um, they're going to ultimately vote something up and down, but it's not it's not always worth watching. Um, okay, so there's these other things called government reports. And again, I'm using just an example of where I live. But every government puts out reports. They say like, we don't understand, like we think there's a problem here. You know local government, please do your research, put together some kind of a, of a report. And these things are super important for just like understanding what the facts are, you know? So this is an example. This is like, you know, the county where I live, Miami-Dade County. Um, they put out this report every year. It's like the status of woman report. And it just has like a lot of data, you know, and you can use it for whatever you want to use it for. But like the under underlying thing is like there's a 13% wage gap between men and women in the county right now. They're trying to close it, but it's still like, that's a good stat. And if you go into the other parts of the report, there's a lot of other data. This kind of report exists for like everything. And I'm saying like everything. And it's using the government's own numbers. So like, if you use it to advocate to the government, they can't say, well, where'd you get that? It's like, no, I got it from you, you know? And I find these things are usually pretty uh, like objective and straightforward. They're, these are not partisan documents, generally speaking. Um, yeah, so there's like a whole bunch of kinds. Of like there's like every there's like state commissions and like departments. So like, you know, the Department of Agriculture in your state probably puts out a bunch of reports. Um, you know, the police departments put out reports with like crime statistics. Um, you know, if the legislature is trying to address a, a specific problem. Um, you, you know, there's a lack of healthcare options in like this very Latino neighborhood in this one city. They're trying to figure it out. Like they will give you the data. Like that's always in these reports. And there's so many of them. You just need to figure out where to get them. Um, and at the federal government, there's like a bunch of kinds of reports from like the Federal Reserve, you know, the FTC, the FCC, just all these alphabet agencies, they all put out so many reports. And then there's like these um, these House and Senate reports, they're kind of politicized. Like right now there's like, you know, commissions to study the weaponization of government. It's probably gonna be pretty partisan, but there are facts in there that you can cite, you know? Um, so it's just like a place where you can pull information from. There's, there's a lot of them. Um, Okay, so I want to move on to like campaign finance, right? Um, again, this is really important to just know where to look, you know? Um, if it's a city race, you're going to need to check like the city database, so a city website, like a county race, county. You know, the federal government to check the federal database, and that's like Congress people, et cetera. So it's like just know where you're looking for um, to go. And once you get into the back end, they're all pretty similar. They just track different information, right? Um, so this is like one of the things I don't think a lot of people really realize, though, but it's something I use a lot is very important is that like, especially this, like the, the, the financial disclosure forms, like if you wanna know why someone's doing something, 
sometimes checking like who they owe money to, who gives them money. Um, they have to disclose those kind of things legally. Um, yeah, like who they owe money to, where, yeah, where they own property. Um, and these are also the kind of documents, especially for like smaller things at a more local level. Like the candidates, a lot of times put their cell phones or their, or their direct email. So you can just like go ahead and you can, you can um, call, you can call them up. Um, I see uh, Shana, um, you asked a question. I'm gonna take questions after I'm done, I think. We'll do like a little Q&A. Um, but yeah, okay, so like campaign documents, that's the stuff. So here's like, you know, an example of like me pulling this up that was kind of interesting. So like Governor DeSantis running for reelection, I'm like, all right, like, who's your money to? Like, what, what, what's driving this guy, you know? Um, and I did this like before he just got elected, but like, here's like how much money he has, right? Which actually, believe it or not, is actually not that much for, for an elected officer at that level. Like typically people are like filthy rich when they become politicians. DeSantis is actually not, like that's not that much money. And and the something very interesting that I found is like, actually he owes a bunch of money in student loans. Like he still owes 21,000 something dollars in student loans, which is like interesting, right? Like he actually has skin in that game. Um, and, and I'm using um, the, you know, the example of, of this governor just to like show the point, like you can pull this up for anyone, like anyone at the federal level, anyone at the state level, your local government, and you can just like, like look under the hood, you know? Sometimes you see people where they owe money around town, you know, to like shady developers and you're like, you know, who's pulling this guy's strings? In the case of DeSantis, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so. You can download the data, like download the data when you go to these like campaign finance things. And then you can put in a spreadsheet and just have a lot of fun with it. Um, you can analyze it. Like I've, I've analyzed, we had a Congresswoman who won election here. She was, uh, you know, Cuban American, but she lived in Puerto Rico for a while. And I found it was like almost half of her money was coming from Puerto Rico, which was very interesting, right? But she has strong connections there. But I only found that when I looked in the data. Um, all right, so court records, um, it's a lot, it's a kind of complicated system because there's so many levels, federal courts for that reason are a lot easier, um, they post more things, they basically have to post everything online and, and searchable, uh, local courts sometimes like they're just a pain in the ass, sometimes you got to go in person and it's not very useful because they have less staff, right, um, this is an example. This is called PACER. This is like the, the federal government's website for, for where to find information. You can find almost anything about any um, court, like federal court case. It's actually very user friendly. Um, like I said, like county courts, like local courts, it's kind of more complicated because like you have you just have like so many jurisdictions that it, it, it can get, even I get complicated or I get confused, I guess, um, because it's just complicated, but you, you know, once you're doing it long enough, you get used to it. Sometimes it's worth going in person because that's where you'll find like, like I put here, like the investigative report that led to an arrest later, like you can find like the actual files, you know, but you have to go into the courts to find that stuff sometimes. Um, okay, this is something like whenever I talk about, um, what do you call it? <laughs> yeah, a hundred times more than, than you have in your checking and savings. Yes, when I said DeSantis is actually not that wealthy, I was talking about for politicians, <laughs> like not in general, for politicians, like look around at who's running your city or whatever. They're like generally filthy rich people. And DeSantis has a lot of money, but he's not that wealthy, which I I thought was interesting. Um, okay, so records requests. Um, it's like something I always get questions about. It's like a fun part of doing reporting because sometimes you can just find stuff. But I can't stress it enough. Like the more specific you are about what you're looking for, the more 
successful you're going to be and the less you know headachey you're going to be the less you're going to be asked to pay for things so like just really understanding you know if you're doing advocacy or looking for information into like one specific department of i don't know the state that you're in like just really learn how that thing works and then you're going to have a lot more success when you're asking for a specific document so you can basically ask for anything like you can ask for reports you can ask for resumes of employees you know citations reprimand letters if someone's getting disciplined like calendars are actually really good for top level people because you can see like who was so and so meeting with you know um like actually see their calendars um you can get their emails and communications you get contracts training documents or presentations right like basically anything you can get it um every state has different laws for public records uh virtually every state has a law they're just different um and the federal law is actually really good we call it a, a foia a freedom of, freedom of information act and um yeah there's examples of things um you know like you can ask for like a copy of all official calendars for X person between this day and that day. Like the way you write these things are, it has to be just like very straightforward and it can't be interpreted in any kind of way. Um, Cause it's kind of a legal document. Like you're directing a lot of times their legal office to like go retrieve these things. And like, they will bullshit you and say like, I don't understand, like this is too broad. So you need to make it almost like legalistic which takes some practice. Um, and I can share, I'm sure with someone, um, I have like templates for sending records requests that I use, um, that I've developed. So yeah, you want contracts, whatever it is, how you do it. And then, so I'll show you a couple of examples, right? Um, this is something that I, I request like every election, even before 2020. <laughs> um, but like, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect election, right? So like, I will request every time there's an election where I live, I'm like, give me a list of all the complaints of the last election, you know? Um, and they give it to you. And, you know, it's come actually very much in handy sometimes because it's like, like, this polling location has had issues four elections in a row. Like, why are we doing elections there? You know, and like that information gives you the power to ask those questions. So this is like, you know, 2020 election. Basically the Republicans are, are arguing that they're not checking IDs, wait time. I mean, they're, they're both complaining about things. And then the Democrats are complaining about things. This is just an example of like information I got that I didn't even really use to be honest, but um, you can get it, you know? And then let me show you, this is like completely different thing. This is a story I reported in 2017, I wanna say, but this is like when Trump came into office and they launched this hotline for like basically reporting crimes of undocumented immigrants, um, even though they use other words. So like I waited a couple months and then like I put in a request. I was like, give me all the call logs. Like give me all the call logs of, of people that are calling this, this, this hotline, right? And it took a while, but I got it. And like what I found was honestly horrifying. Um, so this is like, you know, some of the things I got from a call log. Um, yeah, I said like the logs are a grim running diary of a country where people are, where, where people eagerly re report their fellow residents to the authorities or bring the power of immigration police to, you know, to bear on family disputes. So here's this one case where the guy called ICE on his stepson and then he didn't want to know his wife was trying to get her son deported. And there's like, there's the call log, you know, and I got like a whole list of these things. And the federal government was not at all happy with my reporting in this, I'll say. They even gave me like a cease and desist letter because they released information they shouldn't have. Um, but this is an example of the kind of thing you can get through requesting public records, you know? I didn't have to pay any police on it. Sorry, um, any uh, money for it, it was free. I just read secret police in the chat. Um, okay, so, um, yeah. So yeah, please, like, request public records um, and I will work with anyone to to get the records you're trying to get out because it's important. Um, this is something I don't think a lot of people think about, but it's actually really important for what I do. And I think it's really important 
for advocacy organizations to like think about history and how you tell what story you're telling, you know? Um, because people have memories, you know, and when you connect things that are happening now to things that happened in the past, people tend to respond to it differently because maybe they had a strong reaction of something that happened 10 years ago and they kind of disengaged with politics. And like, if you call it back, they might re-engage with it. You know what I mean? Um, I find like the library is one of my favorite places. Like you can obviously read books, but there's like magazines, newspapers, most libraries have like searchable databases. Um, the one that I use is this thing called Newsbank. Um, it's in like most public library systems across the country. And it's really, really nice. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, there's microfiche. Yeah, I'll show you right now. So uh, this is this website called Newsbank. And like I said, like most public library systems in the US have this um, right now. It's free, totally free. And you can go in there and you can just like look for your doing and like, uh, yeah, why I'm talking about archives. Well, I already kind of said this, but let me, let me show you. So this is like an, an example for a story I did, I don't know, like a month ago or something. So somebody told me, Hey, like that, the little Haiti cultural center in Miami, like just got hit with another structure violation and we're scared they're going to tear it down. Right. And then I talked to someone that was like, you know, this happened like years ago. Like they were trying to tear it down. They were trying to demolish it. Like, I don't have any memory of that, but like it took like two seconds going into the archive and I could find it. And it's like citable. It's like, there it is, 2005. You know, the city, uh, you know, wants to, to demolish it actually. Um, yeah, the city of Miami set to demolish this thing. So then I turn around and I incorporated it, you know, just a couple of graphs in the story that I did. And it got a huge response from people because people remembered it. Like I wouldn't have remembered it, but I pulled it up in a few minutes. And then people were like, yes, this did happen. You know, like connecting what's now, what's going on now to what happened in the place is a very important part of good journalism and good advocacy, right? Because people don't forget, but you need to, you need to help Bring in bring the past back up because you know the past never really leaves us um you know this this is another part of of libraries that's actually really good but this is like a deep level i wouldn't expect everyone to do this all the time i don't do it all the time but it's kind of fun it's like the stuff you see in the movies where they go through the old newspaper clippings again here's something that i recently reported again with with haitians in miami i use this in a podcast um, because people were telling me like there was a Haitian who like hung himself in a jail in, in the 70s because he was going to get deported. And it was like, you know, the beginning of a lot of things that happened federally with our immigration system were in response to this. I couldn't find any like <laughs> I couldn't find any trace of it every, anywhere until I went to the black newspaper in Miami and I pulled up the microfiche records and then I found it. I had like, boom, there we go. Um, so, you know, archives are good. Um, okay, so like, I know it's been fast. It's been like a fast class of like, how to find and gather information, but like, okay, so let's assume you have a lot of information that you want, like, what do you do with it, right? Um, how do you tell a story? How do you do journalism or like storytelling advocacy, right? Like, how do you do it? Um, I think about it like this. It's like cinematography, like if you're watching a film, like there's really wide shots where it's like shows like, okay, you're in a town square in a city and there's like a crowd and then there's one man, you know? And the next one is like the medium shot where it's like mostly just the man and like a tiny bit of background. And then there's like the tight shots where it's like really close up details, right? Like this is how proper, impactful storytelling goes like you rotate between these things you're like here's a big context here's a middle context and here's like the nitty-gritty like tiny details about what's going on in this situation whatever it is you know but like alternating between these three things just like a film will enable you to tell a story that has impact and um you know maybe make something change um this is a really important thing of like just think of the audience um, when it comes to what kind of journalism you're doing. 
like there's like almost anything can be journalism you know your neighborhood whatsapp group let me just use this example like say there's a development that's starting in your neighborhood right your neighborhood whatsapp group might only want to know the traffic report like they might want to know the, the road's going to be closed for one week like that's the most important thing for that audience right um another group of people um say they're like gentrification activists or anti-gentrification activists they're going to want to know like what is this construction project like what is the plan what's it going to look like how is it going to impact the neighborhood are, are there any studies that show what it's going to do right it's a different audience um other people might want to know if they're business owners like how is closing the road going to affect the amount of people that come into their business you know like everyone has different interests everyone has different stakes and kind of knowing who you're writing for or who you're trying to communicate with is really important when it comes to like what do you want to focus on for that um because a general audience is one thing but then there's like micro audiences that are super important to give information to too you know so just keep the audience in mind um this is just like Generally, in, in the journalism world, this is like considered best practice. Um, you don't always have to follow it, but it's called like the inverted pyramid. It's like the first line, the first few lines, like just give people the most important thing that you're sharing with them. Like if it's new information, like here's the headline. And then like, here's like two more sentences about what that headline means, right? That should be first, because a lot of people don't read a lot. So you want to give them like the gist of it off the bat. Um, you know, and then the further you go down, it's like, you know, important, but less important things. And then like, you fill out the context, but like, start generally, if it's like, a very straightforward, like, new thing that you're sharing with people, it makes a lot of sense, to just start with it, because not everyone's gonna, the, a, a minority of people are going to make it to the bottom, or read the whole thing. Um, yeah, and like, it takes a lot of practice to develop a language or a style. But if you're just getting started with this kind of thing, just short and sweet, just short and sweet, just little bits of information. Um, that pyramid that I was saying, it's not a requirement, but it's pretty universal. And we all, because we live in the world, we all like intuitively understand it. Um, and if you have any doubts about like how to tell a story, I usually just tell people like, just pretend you're telling it to a friend. And just say it out loud and then try to like translate what you said into writing or whatever the news form is. Um, there's like a difference, you know. This, so there's like two kinds of storytelling, right? Like the difference between like sharing chisme, right? Like you start like, oh my God, you never know what I saw. I saw, you know, Fulanito did this and then let me tell you about it. That's one way to start a, a something. The other way is like telling a joke with a punchline where like you don't want people to know what you're getting at until the very end. Two very different kinds of storytelling. Um, you know, most of the time the chisme is the way to go, I would say, but be aware there's different ways to tell a story. There's not like one um, way that works and the other ways don't work. It can, it can be a lot of things. Um, yeah, and I was saying this, like, basically any medium can be journalism, like WhatsApp, emails, Instagram, old-fashioned flyering, a neighborhood blog, next door, your, yeah, your tia la radio bemba can be journalism, if she's spreading facts, you know, um, basically anything can be journalism, and, um, all right, hold on, I'm getting to the end here, but, like, this is, how I think of the world and like what democracy looks like. And these things are all very important, right? In a functioning democratic system, you know, it's like, does it start here? Does it start there? Does it start here? I don't know. But at some point, like journalism gives people information that feeds the activism around certain problems, which then pressures the government to do certain things and when the government's doing certain things, it leads feeds back into journalism. And then like this becomes like this virtuous cycle, right? And it's like how a thriving, you know, truly democratized society should work. 
usually in like a uh an authoritarian system like one of these things breaks down first and it's usually journalism because um you know the government doesn't like people reporting on what they're doing right or and then that leads to pressure you know from the activists collapsing because they don't have good information to base activism on so like the whole thing just starts to collapse but this is how you know, the, the system works and journalism and advocacy are really hand in hand in creating a, like a thriving de democratic system. Um, yeah, just following up on that, like, even if you don't do quote unquote journalism, like everything I just shared with you is really important because on my end on it, I talk to advocates all the time and I can't tell you how helpful it is when I talk to advocates that are informed and that know things that I don't know, and they can point me to like documents that are showing what they're arguing. You know, it's one thing if someone says, you know, this happened and I believe it's because of this. It's another thing if you say this happened and this happened and look at these documents that suggest to me that this is what's really going on, right? It's a completely different conversation. And those are the people that I tend to go back to over and over again, because it's like these people are doing their homework, you know what I mean? Um, and it makes my job easier. I got like, you know, independently verify what they're giving me, right? But it like gives me, it's less to work on my part. So like good advocacy informs journalism. It's not always journalism informing advocacy. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, basically it i think like this is how democracy works this is how journalism works i know we went through a lot of stuff um we have some time for q a i guess that's all folks <laughs> um thank you all i'm gonna stop my sharing and um yeah so thanks everyone for joining does anyone have any questions? I have, um, okay, Shauna asked in the Q&A thing, um, and I know she said she had, she had to leave. Um, are there any ways we can help local reporters do their jobs? Like I said, literally, like, one of the best ways to help local journalists is to, like, if you're doing your homework and your research, then like package it up and like share it with a reporter who's reporting on something that you're that you're researching and just like give it to them just provide it to them you know if it saves someone a couple hours of of scratching around government websites and trying to find this or that and you just like hand it to them like that's a huge thing you know maybe that that person is going to be able to do a lot more work because you made their job just a lot easier so so that's one way that anyone can basically help local reporters or, you know, just start posting things on your own. I mean, like we don't have to be the middlemen. Um, I don't think it should be like that. Um, but yeah, does anyone else have any questions? Hold on, Q and A. What role, Luke asks, what role can a nonprofit play in the process of reporting? Um, I think it depends on, how um like what kind of work a nonprofit is doing i mean some nonprofits do produce reports that you know lead to stories on their own like there's um you know some groups here that i've done reporting with it's because they they put together um information using like statistics from the courts and from they they they, they just compile a bunch of information and like one thing and there's like an activist bent to it in a way but it's like based on like solid concrete facts and like that kind of thing helps people a lot yeah white papers exactly um it, it's helpful for your organization because like th those are the things that drive what you're doing but like when it's packaged in a way um that's easy easily like digestible for for a reporter then you know you can potentially take it and make a story out of it and further explore it. And maybe a journalist can dig into places where that you guys didn't see or find like case studies that you guys didn't get into because you weren't 
working on case studies. Maybe you're working on just like data. And if, you know, sometimes what we, we look for like the human stories, you know what I mean? So these things very much do feed into each other. Um, and also, you know, just if you're in a nonprofit, just like, you know, communicate, answer the phone, respond to text messages and stuff like that helps a lot. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Um, let me let me scroll up through the all the chat. Thank you, Susan. Hope you like that. Um, but yeah, I um, I don't know what else to say necessarily. Um, I'm very happy that you know I was invited to do this. I think it I think it's important. And um, I hope everyone took something out of this, got something out of this. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Everyone have a good uh, advocacy week, you know?